Hello everybody. This is lesson 25 of the lecture International Economics. I will discuss slides 98 to 122 of chapter 4 International Financial Crisis. This lesson is about the so-called East Asian financial market crisis that took place between the years 1997 and 1998. We've already addressed East Asian economic history in connection with various trade policy concepts in Chapter 1 of this lecture. The so-called East Asian Tiger States succeeded in starting a growth catch-up process based on the concept of export-oriented industrialization which increased significantly the per capita income and the real wages of these countries in the course of the 80s and 90s of the last century. An important driver in this catch-up process was an investment boom, which triggered investment ratios between 20 and 30 percent of GDP in these countries. This investment boom was made possible by opening the economies and their capital markets for foreign investors following the concept of export oriented industrialization. However, this investment boom did not take place without temporary disruptions. As this chart of the Dow Jones Index shows, there was a stock market jump around here, which was related especially to the economic development in East Asian countries. This slump in the American stock market was however overcome nearly in the same year completely. Because the American central banks followed by a couple of other especially European central banks reacted very quickly by easing money supply. So they provided cheap money to buy stock and other assets and helped thereby to overcome this strong reduction in stock market prices. This action by the Federal Reserve was later ironically referred to as the Greenspan put after its then president Alan Greenspan because it signaled equity investors that the United States Central Bank is providing monetary policy to hedge share prices against excessive falls. This type of monetary policy remains therefore highly controversial until today. Many market observers blame it for fueling the so-called internet speculative bubble which then burst in spring of the year 2000. But that's another story. This chart shows, based on the East Asian share index called Singapore Strait Times, that the East Asian economic crisis began already around the year 1997 but was already nearly overcome by the end of the year 1999. How did it come to this crisis? Well, as already mentioned, during the 80s countries which practiced the concept of export-oriented industrialization like South Korea, Thailand, the Philippines, 
Malaysia and Hong Kong and also Indonesia experience a strong growth of their per capita income and real wages which was first financed by their high domestic saving ratios. At the beginning of the 90s of the last century they opened also their capital markets for foreign investment. This marked the start of a massive acceleration of global financial integration. The inflowing international capital caused massive price gains in East Asian stock and real estate markets. The era was called the East Asia boom. Following this boom, international investors became very optimistic for the East Asian economies and bought not only stock but also offered a lot of credits to East Asian banks and firms. Until the year 1997, these East Asian countries attracted more than half of total capital inflow to developing countries. East Asian banks borrowed from international investors and lent this money to domestic firms, collateralized by growing value of real estate wealth of these firms mostly. A fixed exchange rate policy against the US dollar by East Asian central banks reinforced foreign investment because it suggested for these investors the absence of any exchange rate risk. Affluent credits encourage East Asian firms to make investments and more and more risky and less attractive investment opportunities. Despite their very low labor costs, East Asian industries, especially the mechanical and electrical machinery industries, became one of the most capital intensive industries in the world. Active industrial policies by governments increased the willingness of banks to support such investments. In the course of time, more and more firms had problems to pay back their debt because the commercial success of their investments failed. So domestic debtors, namely these firms, got more and more stuck into trouble. Banks therefore had to prolong credits to firms in order to prevent a bankruptcy of these firms. So banks started to finance long-term domestic loans to firms with foreign short-term interest credits. This caused two kinds of discrepancies. First the so-called maturity discrepancy. The loans the banks granted had a long-term maturity while they were financed with short-term liabilities from international investors. Additionally, the loans handed over to domestic firms were denominated in domestic currencies while the liabilities in foreign currencies were primarily denominated in US dollar. As a consequence, the structure of the balance sheets of these banks deteriorated. This scenario implied that East Asian economies had become vulnerable against higher interest rates. Given the highly indebted domestic firms, an increase in domestic interest rates by central banks would have made it even more difficult for the commercial banks to refinance their troubled credits. Therefore, higher domestic interest rates would have increased the pressure for domestic banks 
to borrow abroad or increase the interest rate on bank credits. Therefore, more and more international speculators believe that East Asian central banks were not able to defend the fixed exchange rate against the dollar of their currencies by increasing their domestic interest rates. As a consequence, these speculated, speculators started to attack East Asian central banks by speculating against East Asian currencies. They sold East Asian currencies on the forward market, let's say for $2 per won, the strike-through W is the symbol of the South Korean currency won. Now, they sold won for dollar on the forward market in the hope of a depreciation of the won on the spot exchange market, let's say to a level of one dollar per won, such that they could buy one won on the spot market for one dollar and sell it for two dollar on the forward market based on their forward contracts. This is of course a quite profitable kind of deal. These type of speculative activities on the forward market cause the forward exchange rate to depreciate. And this made foreign investments more attractive for East Asian investors. We can now use the interest parity relationship to see how this developed. The depreciation of the forward exchange rate caused the right hand side of the equation to become larger than the left hand side. So foreign investment was now more attractive as before. The result of this was more domestic investors started to supply domestic currency on the spot market in order to buy foreign assets. The result of this was that now actually the spot rate, the spot market exchange rate also decreased just as expected by the speculators. Now this depreciation of the spot exchange rate implied that the exchange rate became now lower than the informally fixed exchange rate by central banks. To prevent this, the central banks had now to increase the domestic interest rates. Higher domestic interest rates, however, increased the refinancing problems of domestic commercial banks, as already discussed. And as a consequence, this would have worsened the maturity and currency structure of their balance sheets. Now international investors became alarmed and refused to roll over short-term credits to East Asian banks. Banks experienced severe problems in refinancing their long-term credits to firms. Firms with maturing credit lines had problems in finding new credit supplies. So massive political pressure towards central banks to lower the interest rates emerged. Given this pressure, more and more East Asian central banks gave up their exchange rate targets and started to support the domestic private sector with lower interest rates. As a consequence, exchange rates of East Asian currencies towards the US dollar actually depreciated massively. So now the currency speculators had 
actually won the attack against East Asian Central Banks. They were able to buy East Asian currencies at the very low depreciated spot market rates, let's say one dollar per won, and they could sell these currencies with the help of their forward contracts at correspondingly higher exchange rate, let's say two dollar for one won. And that means they made huge profits. Here in this numerical example, one dollar per won. For the East Asian banks, the currency discrepancy became now, however, a big problem. Since most banks had accepted dollar-denominated credits, their debt burden measured in domestic currency increased by the depreciation of the spot exchange rate. Now, not only private firms were over-indebted, but also private commercial banks. Let me show this a little bit more detailed with the help of this graph. This graph shows the structure of a balance sheet of an East Asian commercial bank. It consists of loans to domestic companies, here at a numerical example of 100 won, and credits from foreign creditors let's say equal to $200, which at a spot exchange rate of $2 per won equals 100 won, the amount of money handed over to domestic firms. So at an exchange rate of $2 per won, no problem emerges. The balance sheet is balanced. Liabilities measured in domestic currency equal the assets measured in domestic currency units. If, however, a depreciation of the domestic currency happens, let's say from $2 per won to $1 per won, the amount of liabilities grows measured in domestic currency, while the outstanding assets stay at the same level, 100 won. So we have now liabilities of 200 won, while we have outstanding assets equal to 100 won. And this means that we have more liabilities measured in domestic currency as we have assets. So a deficit emerges which causes bankruptcy if no government support is granted. As a consequence of this development, investors, international investors, started to panic. They threw back as much credits as possible so that the international credit supply to East Asian countries vanished. Numerous firms and banks went bankrupt. The financial market crisis became a perfect storm. Contagion effects to countries with a similar credit structure emerged and led to credit withdrawals, for example, from Russia and several Latin American countries. A regional East Asian financial market crisis was on the brink to become a worldwide financial market crisis. However, an easing of monetary policy by the American Federal Reserve and several European central banks massively increased the credit supply to the world capital markets and helped to support many debtors in trouble. As a result, the financial market crisis was soon overcome. As this diagram shows, the consequences of the East Asian financial market crisis were also soon overcome by East Asian countries as well. After a brief slump, 
Per capita GDP soon recovered from the shock. And the long-term successful development path of these export-oriented industrialization countries became not permanently blocked by this financial market crisis. As this diagram shows, the very high investment rates measured in percent of GDP became somewhat lower after the crisis. Compared to other countries, however, they were still on a relatively high level. The depreciation of the currencies of East Asian countries, which had been triggered by the speculative attack, made their goods cheaper on the world market and thus even led to an increase in the export ratios after the crisis. This, of course, helped also the real economy of these countries to recover relatively fast from this financial market shock. Here too, we can ask again whether this financial market crisis contained the typical components of a financial market crisis. What was the initial shock? Initial shock was the financial market deregulation that took place in the 90s. East Asian countries opened their capital markets for foreign investors. The positive feedback mechanism was caused by foreign investors, which increased the demand for East Asian stock and real estate assets. As a result, this caused an increase in the prices of these assets, which then led to the expectation of further price increases. Expectation of further price increases led once again to an increase in the demand for stock and real estate assets, and so on. The funding source of this financial market bubble was the increase in foreign investment due to the economic opening for international capital. And the negative shock was a currency attack by international speculators on East Asian currencies at the beginning of the year 1997. So we do actually find all these components that we have already observed in other financial market crisis episodes. So much for this lecture.